Definitely. So what's new today? What's new today? I have an indie web question, but I, I don't know if that's on topic. Uh, sounds in bounds, well in bounds. Close enough for me. Um, I've, uh, um, it, well, it's, it's also like, I need a little bit of help. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the indie web is all about. Yeah. There you go. I've, I've been too shy to ask on the chat. Um, so I figured I would, I would talk about it. I'm going to the meeting this, uh, uh, this weekend. Yeah. So thanks, okay. thanks again, Chris. Um, but anyway, the, the problem is I'm trying to um, had a lot of fun uh, with Indie Login and Indie Auth and Meetable and all that kind of stuff. Um, but on Meetable, I cannot get my full name to show up. So I've been trying HCard this and HCard that. And... Yeah, it's, I think it's usually it's parsing your HCard to find a first name and a last name. Is any name showing up? Um, let me uh, let me share my browser and we'll we'll look at it. If this is again, tell me when this is not interesting. Um, for for what it's worth, by the way, Jerry, I, the indie web stuff is was really brilliant, um, super fun. Um, and the main problem is uh, not. Um, uh not enough adoption so I've, I've had a lot of thought about that mm -hmm. so i i so so this is my home page of course um and i've been doing this over and over and over so i see peter kaminsky wiki showing up at least so that's you know that's a start well, this is this is my site, so I'm in control of it. <laughs> I can make do, make it do what I want. Um, uh, right here is my uh, identity stuff. <clears throat> so I think the display none is not the problem. Uh, so you're only showing the tab with your Peter Kaminsky dot wiki uh, in it. You're not showing uh, your full screen. Uh, I'm showing my that that browser window. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know how to stop the sharing. <laughs> um, I'll find it here. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't know if I'll find it. <laughs> huh. Where is it? Show me what I'm sharing. Can you click on the start oh, screen sharing button again? There you go. Good. Phew. I wonder. I wonder if I can share a window. Um, let me try again. I guess. I guess I don't have anything too embarrassing on my whole screen, so maybe I'll just do that. Oops. Um, window. Maybe I'll do the window. Um, thanks. Thanks for checking it, Chris. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like the data is there. So then, if I uh, uh, um, so part of, part of what may be happening too is you've marked up everything and gotten it straight and. It's possible that that um, if you're talking about the events.indieweb site, it's possible that they're caching stuff. Yeah. So yeah, you thanks. can always say, but you can always kind of say, "I'm not going." Yeah. Do something else, and then re yeah. read, click the button, and it should pull the yeah. right data. Um, so this is, this is what it looks like. I've, I've tried that. I've tried, I'm not going, I'm going. 
um, doesn't doesn't help. The other fix so, is that we all start calling you Peter Kaminsky Wiki. Yeah, you know that wouldn't be bad, but I'm I'm also sad about that. It well actually, I wouldn't care if everybody else was like this, but it's it, I feel like a um, um what is it in Twitter a blue egg or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like he oh, he can't get it together. <laughs> yeah, the social pressure to like you know get the things moving. No, right. Um, well, see this. See these are the right kinds of questions. Actually, be in the chat to get some help with. Because then it gives you the experience of getting the immediate help within the chat. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. And l very likely is not. You'll get somebody like Aaron Parecki who created this particular meeting yeah. site, or you'll get Tantek Chelik, yeah, like helping you out and giving you pointers. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm encouraged to lean on the chat more. Eh? Um, or I'm trying to remember. The, um, a, another component of my shyness is that uh, I was I was setting up to do. I actually I, I, I was going to set up India Auth and I gave up, <laughs> um, like an India Auth server, and I gave up. So I, I fell back on using just using GitHub, and India Log, Login is great at that. Um, but when I was ready to pull the trigger, uh, it was like early in the morning and Indie Login was down. Actually, it was late at night, super late at night. <clears throat> I had a hell of a time finding who runs Indie Login. If Indie Login is not up, you have no clue. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so it, you know, I, I did some sleuthing and I found Aaron. I, I said, I think Aaron is probably the maintainer of the Indie Login code, and maybe he's the maintainer of the site. And so I sent him an email. And, and as soon as he woke up in the morning, he's like, oh, crap. It always crashes and doesn't come back. And I, I kicked it, and it's good again. And so anyway. Yeah, I, usually if you're, if it's Indie Web infrastructure, he has built or maintains big chunks of yeah. all of it, or has, and most I, of it. And open, I know that now. <laughs> most of it's all open source too. So if you run, want to run it yourself, you could. Yep. Um, or mm -hmm. or it's uh, documented on the Indie Web Wiki what the thing is and who may be running or own or maintain or do whatever. So you can always kind of search there. Um, um cool uh thanks i'll hit up chat more or or just wait and, for the you know weekend. but the, and they'll they'll love you dearly <laughs> and if they don't immediately love you say chris sent me and you'll <laughs> get at least some some small sheen there but the fact that you can write code and do you could implement most of the stuff they've got you know in a couple of couple of you know vacation days if you wanted yeah yep. um, uh, um, and I to be honest to going back a few minutes I, I in my mind I always call you Peter wiki Kaminsky <laughs> so it's interesting to see you have <laughs> so with that URL you've put wiki at the end instead of in the middle where I put it as a nickname but you know that's uh thank you for that um if the dns worked out that way I'd, i would take it the other way <laughs> i do have uh uh kemen dot ski so oh nice i don't know exactly what i'm going to do with that but peter dot wiki dot peter, peter at kemen dot <laughs> ski yeah which would be good i mean you're still on iStory. what's the what's or, the story behind iStory? you know even better, I think I've got Minsky, so I could I I could do K at Minsky min oh. I think that's what it is. <laughs> so K at min dot SKI. Uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Or or Peter K at Minsky dot min dot ski. Oh. Um, the the story with uh, I I story is useful or uh, thanks, Chris. Been all over that page. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, uh, too too shy to, to ask people in the chat um, or something. 
I figured well, I'd, I'd the, the, most of the key is if you are going through something and you hit a roadblock and you can't figure out why, what happens is somebody will either fix it so that it just works the next time for the next person, or they'll document what's happening so that when somebody like you gets stuck, there's documentation for why did you get stuck? And I, so, so, so maybe a, a meta comment about um, talking about talking about it in this call. The um, microformats is really well documented, of course, but then the the practice of indie web and microformats together, kind of, some of it's on the wiki, some of it's on blog posts, and there's like it ends up like there's four or five or six different ways to do it, you know, and they're all different ages, kind of, mm -hmm. especially if you go to, I, I think there, there's some age card builder, um, you know, yeah. that's just really old. And oh, so, cool. yeah. um, so I tried that and it makes interesting, you know, interesting code, but it didn't work either. So. Um, but the one of the anyway, but there's the a lot of the older stuff and some of those little builder things people did almost a decade ago um, are our version one of that micro format setup and there is a new version two yeah and generally yeah, right. the the where the real power is there's probably a dozen parsers written in a dozen different languages that all support version one and version two yeah. so that when you're using this stuff generally it works so there's like weird projects probably like that h card builder that are standalone that nobody ever updated um but versions of it exist and in the 21 years that stuff has been around even though older versions exist and still work most of the stuff has been kept current at least in terms of the big parsers. Um, and it's also tended to um, coagulate towards a closer standard, even though some of the old stuff, you can just try it out and it really, it will work yep. because the parsers all support it. But there are kind of easier, better ways of doing some of these things now that everyone has long since settled on. Yeah. that make doing some of the stuff a whole lot easier. And hopefully most of the documentation on the micro formats page and on the indie web wiki pages are all reasonably up to date and reflect all those changes over time. That's that's a really good observation. Thank you. I I'm uh I, I actually remember uh, micro formats one um back in the day. Um and I used to hang out in the same circles as Tontec a little bit. So you know I, I saw that stuff when it was new and actually I think at Foo Camp. Um, uh, but I have forgotten that I had even forgotten about it. I think I now, now I think microformats too is just microformats, you know? And so you, I think you're right. The H card generator I was using is probably microformats one. Um, so, so maybe the takeaway for me is it would be nice to hunt all those things down and kill them on the web instead of leaving them lying around. Um, yeah. maybe, or at least make them look uh, more historical, I guess, maybe not kill them. Yeah. Well, I think that if you look at that, if I remember, cause it's been probably five years since I've looked at it, one or more of those H there were, I think two or three of them, but they all looked like 2010 web technology. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, at least the design of the pages all said, Hey, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> and, and the way they use the text uh, input boxes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Tantec and the others and also IndieWeb and Fediverse people would be real fun participants in these calls because we keep going back to them. Yeah. We keep talking. Well, about it it, it kind of kills me because um, ages ago, Kevin Marks did a, a poll request, I think, on Mastodon and got it to support all of the micro formats natively. Yep. But I, it's almost been two years now that they went to JavaScript didn't read format. Um, so you can't parse a URL and get any data out of it anymore the way you used yeah. to, hmm. uh, which is kind of sad. Um, but I, you know, the tough part for me is on all the wiki stuff I do, 
unless you're writing HTML into it. I don't think anybody's ever put work or time or effort into having micro formats work with markdown syntax, yeah. which would be a cool thing so that you could just write a wiki in a wiki like way and it would still, all the parsers would understand what's going on or even things that the simple thing. And I thought about it this morning and I want to, I'll put out a call because surely someone has solved it, but even the double bracket wiki links syntax, being able to resolve within at least a don't it's its own domain to say, Hey, there's a document that goes to this place and the double brackets mean it should just resolve automatically. I don't know if anybody has written that code because I was looking at, um, uh th there's a tool called doxify and somebody has simplified it supremely so that you can run it on your own server just dump the code on your server and it should just work and i'm pretty sure it doesn't and it's called doxify this dot net or something and so you can literally if there is a markdown file or text file on the web somewhere that you can point it at it will put it up and display a, a web page. So you can instantaneously publish any text document really. Nice. But I'm almost dead certain, I haven't tried it yet, hopefully later today or tomorrow, but I'm almost dead certain Wikilinks are not gonna work on it at all. Um, which means I can't just dump a million files up and expect that you can browse through them one, one to another, which, seems like a, you know, a fairly low tech thing to be able to do. But, you know, maybe you've solved that problem before, Peter, I don't know. I, I actually had a version of Massive Wiki Builder that, that was dynamic like this. Um, I forget about links, though. I think they I were. I, the, the trick is that you can't, like, you, when you're rendering the page, yeah, I guess you can check if the links exist. Um, I think there is um, the guy who did all the work to make um, uh, Activity Pub work for WordPress. I think I think he has something similar to it built into WordPress, so that if you put a hashtag on something, it automatically turns it into a tag link in WordPress. So he's got kind of that code going the other direction for tags yep. and not necessarily for link link wiki links and URLs. Yeah. Um, and it's quite possible that um, Flancian maybe has done something like that. But alas. Chris, I don't think I understood the thing you said about double bracket references where something's not happening so if i have a, a server and i put up a thousand markdown files on it and there is a double bracketed wiki link in that text you essentially you need some kind of code on the server to recognize there's a double bracketed thing and then have it say, okay, I know what this word is. Let's look for that document name in all the rest of the files at this level. Is this or a level of lower below? Is this sort of what Obsidian does internally with its vaults and with internal yeah. references? Yeah. So Obsidian does that automatically and it's okay. still running. But when I do that and put it up on the web, yeah. It it would be nice if here's a folder with all these files and they just would automatically interlink. Yes. And this is my puzzlement with sort of where we are with massive wiki and stuff like that. And that there's a lot of nifty power in obsidian that vanishes when you publish it <clears throat> as, as a static website, it would be really nice to make the round trip or, or to sort of bridge the union. Pete, I'm forgetting you had project Opal and some, some other name as well for what might complete that loop. Yeah.
I I would I'm I'm trying to look through there the Doxify showcase for a good wiki. I I would imagine it just works. The 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 thing that the thing that gets a little bit tricky is deciding whether or not the page exists or not. Um, so Massive Wiki Builder didn't have it for a long time, but now um, when you go to a page and you have a wiki link that isn't resolved, doesn't have a resolution page, um, it it knows it and it actually doesn't even make a link out of it. It makes it look kind of like a red, it's a red link, you know, but it, it's not even a link. It's just a div that, uh, with some special formatting. So you know not to click, uh, you know, an incipient page link. But you could do that, I think, even even with a, um, something like Doxify. Yeah, there's I, there's just so many tools, or so many people are trying to take things where they double bracket stuff and they put it on the web somewhere. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, the problem is, or they're doing it in Obsidian privately, and then it's like, okay, let's publish this, and it's there and it's great. But none of the links work because they're wiki links instead of HTML links. Yeah. So kind of bridging the HTML and Markdown, just yeah. a scotch better, or putting in some shims or bridges that kind of make the two equivalent. So if you had things like that or things like, um, you know, micro formats that work, that you, and the nice part is you probably could just say, here's what I'm going to make the standard. And, it, and have it force it to work at least on one website, then other people could either take that and build on it or force it to work. But a lot of times I find myself writing HTML in some of those documents so that I can get yeah. the benefit of the, the micro format stuff to work because there are places where it, it just does lovely, wonderful things particularly for parsers that do it. Um, and one of my favorite examples, and I don't know why it never got codified into social media. Um, and I'll, I'll use it as an example here, but there's uh, the site huffduffer.com. I can log in and give it my website as my identity and then it will go and parse my website and find all of the versions of me on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. And if they're all marked up properly, you can go to my identity page on HuffDuffer and it'll give you the entire list of everywhere else I am in social media. And I don't ever have to maintain it or update it in 57 spots. I can maintain it in one spot and everywhere else should just know. Yep. Um, or everyone, uh, everywhere else can kind of rerun the code and update it so that it's, you know, just there. Um, but I don't have to rewrite my identity and my profile and where you can find me everywhere else. I can just do it in one central place and everyone else will know. So interesting. So did we get all the indie web questions out of the way? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if we were about to switch topics. <laughs> um, but it, a... you know, it, it definitely comes into play because it's all about getting the, the, all the links to work work together properly. Yeah. And about being findable and linkable. Um, I was going to ask a, a, a probably a light question, which is in the last NeoBooks call. Um, someone mentioned the indie web page for commonplace books, yes. uh, which is nice and rich and all that. And I got to wondering, like, is my brain a commonplace book? Like, yeah, I, I, I don't, does it fall under the, I don't really know the, the edge cases or the definition of commonplace book in some sense. Um, the, so there, are, so there are pages on the indie web wiki for commonplace book. Zettelkasten and I think Digital Garden, which are all 
flavors of the same type of ice cream. They just have slightly different flavors, maybe. Um, is probably the better way to think about it. And if you look at the edit pages of most of those, the vast majority of edits on them are from me. Um, <laughs> And it's and then that's been part of the process of trying to kind of slightly differentiate what each one is doing and how. So in the older version, the slightly older definition of commonplace book, as they've historically been done, typically they were quotes and excerpts of other things that you read that you collected. And not necessarily so much original stuff your own original ideas or things, although many people over time have injected that stuff into it. But typically they were little snippets of things you collected along the way and you organized them and reused them in other places. Um, and then there are versions of like Zettelkasten that are essentially commonplace books done in a slightly different format. In digital, it doesn't matter because you don't have a big differentiation between a page and a an individual note. Um, but if you get into all the extra complex, like arranging and ordering of things, and there are not a lot of examples online of people doing that other than Niklas Luhmann's original version, because nobody else was doing that other than him uh, historically, as far as I can tell. Interesting. Uh, and then the digital garden space, um, it, it really kind of became a thing in 2017, 2018, um, when some of us in the indie web were playing around and calling it that. And then I think Maggie Appleton kind of popularized it with her incarnation and chatting about it on Twitter. Um, but a lot of it goes back to commonplace book traditions or early wiki esque types of online functionality, um, you know, or ideas of things like the garden of forking paths mm -hmm. type of thing. So, uh, but in, I would say in a general sense, a lot of what you're doing within the brain certainly fits under the, the, the bigger umbrella of the thing, mm -hmm. um, your actual practice and you're linking things together along the way, which a lot of commonplace book things don't other than through their index, which takes extra work. Um, and I think that's one of the nice parts about the brain is it adds that linking in automatically. Like right. you, I, I presume you could throw things into the brain with outlinking them the way you do. But I think most of the value you get back out of it is the fact that everything you put into it is linked to something else. Yep. I, and I um, hate orphan thoughts. <clears throat> I, I do not, I, do, I try not to leave behind any orphan thoughts, but there's other people who will have a brain that has lots of different little patches of stuff that are not connected. And I'm like, yeah. Why? is there a UI that shows you orphan stuff? Um, I think there was once a feature that lets you find orphans. I don't go, I'll go check. I mean, I, to me, that was that really, that's one of the values of, and nobody talks about it because in obsidian and Rome research and a lot of these other places, you're almost encouraged to throw in random orphan thoughts mm -hmm. as the default. Right. But I think one of the most valuable things that Luman pulled out of his particular practice is you write it on a card and the physical act of filing it and putting it into the system forces the link. So you would never ever have, or if you did, you'd have an orphan link that was at least some somewhere close to something else interesting. Um, but because of the way he numbered a system, it tended to force things to always have links. So your idea would at least be related to the thing, the card just in front of it, if not also the card after it. Right. If you, um, it's at least got a relationship in time. But al almost every other digital platform that does that 
takes that affordance away and just you've got a mound of a bunch of stuff that is way less useful. And I think in every historical context I've ever seen, um, and I, it's I think almost dead sure that's where we get the phrase scrap heap as a junk pile in modern usage is here's my scrap of paper that's got my note on it and I'm going to put it in a pile on my desk and I may have four or five piles, but I may have the pile that I just never have organized in any way, shape or form. And that scrap heap literally when I'm dead is work that means nothing to anyone else. They just don't have that context. Thanks, Chris. So, you know, Chris, what was the, um, the thing that you were just mentioning that did have that default linking? Uh, uh, Zettelkasten? Well, you were talking about Zettelkasten, but weren't you saying there was somebody or something that... Uh, Nicholas. So, yeah, Nicholas Lumen. Um, the inventor of Zettelkasten. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Or the inventor uh, of his flavor of the a piece of tech from now that... that Sorry. Um, so yeah. his his index card version did that automatically. I'm not sure there. And the way Jerry uses the brain, Jerry does that. Um, if you're careful about it, you can use Obsidian that way if you wanted to. But you'd have to make that part of your daily practice to force that to happen in some sense. Um, but I'm I'm not really sure. There's a lot of note-taking apps that force that affordance as part of the practice and then what ends up happening is you have a huge pile of notes that I, you can use search and filtering and you know other things to kind of make up for it but you kind of have to know that something's there to be able to search for it and hopefully your memory is at least good enough to do that but it's not always the case or tags, tags do that in a lot of sense, but sure. um, in fact, I've been thinking I default metadata that, you know, is also searchable, which is not the case with obviously a physical card, but you know, that, that you have um, date length, text search tags, if you added them, but yeah, I mean, short of adding tags that there are some attributes um, well, I almost think of it too, or have been thinking of it in, in a weird, a different hierarchical perspective that you may have topics like, you know, math and science and history that are big, all encompassing top level categories. And then as you narrow down, you may get into things like topology versus differential geometry in math. But you can keep narrowing down to smaller and smaller tags. But in some sense, a link from one individual note to another is the smallest tag you could put on something to show kind of a joint ownership. And I don't think a lot of people think of linking things together in that same in that same way. Um, is a really super highly specific tag that only two things would have in common. And it's so small that you you don't have a name for it other than the generic name of link. One of the habits I ended up doing was when things collected up a bit too much under a thought, I would create a types of whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and that would take all the subclasses and kind of lump them together. And it gets really interesting because it's simple to do, consistent. And then one day I realized, oh, I have all these types of thoughts. So I thought, hey, I should connect them all up to a thought called types. <laughs> Don't ever pick up a category theory book, Peter. All right, I'm Jerry. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, it will be the end of you. It will, totally. Nobody will ever hear from me again. Other fellowshipy topics, questions, thoughts?
Um, I will share something I'm working on just because it is, uh, it's linky, if not fellowshipy, um, uh, with um, with a, a, a collaborative technology alliance subgroup and related to um, work that Pam and I are both involved in with the ESC group um, on uh, compiling a compendium of entity types for um, for organizations, businesses, uh, with the aim to help people find some things that are not um, DC funded um, supports to uh, do things in the information sharing space um, that will hopefully provide business incentives for cooperation as opposed to um, dog eat dog competition. Um, so I'm just speaking that into this group in case anybody knows of some resources that they would recommend or um, people who uh, might not be involved or like that. You know, we're just things from, uh, you know, um, purpose-driven uh, trusts to, uh, you know, different forms of co-ops and multi-part co-ops and, um, of course, you know, B-Corps and benefit corps and non-profit. How about products. the zebras? Zebras, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's sort of like beyond just being a co-op, where do zebras where can zebras happily live? Um, because, you know, I mean, we're, we're at least recognizing zebras, but zebras are still having trouble and yeah. full of unicorn chasers. Um, so you're, you're trying to build the savanna so they, and, and the river so they have a place to live and eat. Kind of, yeah. I guess you could use that metaphor. I mean, I would almost say it's like, um, trying to identify some, yeah, some some oases that they don't they don't know that exist. Um, you know that that they can cooperatively share without killing each other off. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll take your metaphor. Um, Michael, I just put a brain link in the chat to more exotic forms of organization, which is kind of a level down from basic co-ops and all that. I also have types of cooperatives is a thought because there's many subclasses. And then there's also an interesting bunch of stuff under types of governance because there, yeah. are, many, there are many ocracies. <clears throat> and, yeah, uh, yeah. And I mean, honestly, the, the like governance question, well, it's super relevant to these things. I'm almost, you know, trying to avoid touching that because um, it, you can have like many different forms of governance. I mean, it gets really, you know, the, the, the possible combinations of governance and entity structure are in the billions. Um, just, just sticking to entities is, um, I mean, a pro and a con. I mean, part of the, 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 Part of the um, initial spreadsheet is like, okay, here are a bunch of entity types. Here are the pros and here are the cons. And sometimes the you know cons or pros can include aspects of governance that you know this entity type makes more difficult or, um, or easier. Um, so governance is addressed, but um, but not trying to break down every form of governance. But cool, I mean, thank you for this. I figured it was worth saying out loud in this group. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what brought off, uh, I was just looking at the Huffer Duffer, uh, the Huff Duffer site, what brought that up? Uh, 
I was using it as an example of where having uh, micro formats on a website to create common identities was useful. And I think that's the one of the few social media sites I've seen who used micro formats so that when you go to my identity page, I, if something changes, I can change it on my website but I don't have to go to every other social site on the planet and change everything else there. The Huff Duffer picks that up and makes the change for me. Oh, that's but, cool. You know, it's also a fun, you know, music bookmarking service. Um, yeah. Music or podcasts, I guess. Right. It looks for podcasts. But... Yeah. Well, the nice part too is it's got an RSS, a custom RSS feed that I can subscribe to. So everything I bookmark automatically goes into my feed reader on my podcast client. So there's always something fun to listen to when I'm in the car. Nice. Yeah. I was just looking at that because it's interesting to me as like a format. I think that could be very, like, broad, more broadly applied. Yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I think of it as like the TiVo for the podcast and the audio space. Although a lot of um, in the last, I don't know, five years, a lot of podcast, big corporate podcast things make it hard to find the actual audio file in the page. Um, so, you know, it may take some work to strip it out, depending on which podcast platform you find something in. Yeah. It's interesting. I've actually uh, been playing around with something for this. Let me see if I can. I'll pull it up real quick and screen share. Um, let's see. So, like, one of the things I've always been really interesting to me is like, how do you get the mechanics of a single page app? while still having a normal static website. Because there's some things that single page apps are good for, like this type of concept, like something like Huffer Duffer, you have a bunch of things you want to listen to and you're on a website. And maybe some of them are audio files, and maybe some of them are embeds, right? But there, <clears throat> when you navigate around, of course, whatever you're watching will be broken or you have to rely on like a pop out, which, like that functionality in the browser is for good security reasons getting worse and worse all the time. So this is like really uh, rough because I just figured out some pieces of it and it's still in progress. Um, uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. Let's see. Share. I, I haven't actually, I don't think Okay, yeah, you can see my Chrome screen here. So this is an 11 site. Every page is statically generated and exists as a standalone page. But, and I mentioned this before, I'm playing around with a tool called HTMX, which essentially lets you look at HTML and mutate your DOM. So you could go to any single page on this website, it's not on a URL yet, um, and get a static HTML page. But once HTMX is loaded in, it's only changing, you can't really see it, but it's only changing a portion of the page. So right now, like, even though the URL has changed and the history state has changed, right, it is only changing a portion of the page behind the scenes. And so you can do something where you're like, well, since I'm only changing a portion of the page, I can freeze one part of the page. Um, and get a YouTube embed or any other type of media embed in theory. I'm just starting with YouTube. Um, though, of course, now this is this U particular YouTube doesn't want to work. Um, let's try that again. Does it think I'm faking? Let's see. The, the curse of live demo. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Right. So there's music playing. Um, and this is playing video, right? And now I can go back to the home page. Still playing. Still playing. I could go to another page. 
And this would queue up the next file into this player, which is a custom HTML thing. And in the background, it's still playing everything around. And if I were to go back, it's still playing, even though I'm hitting the back button. So like this is because I'm very interested in like something like Huffer Duffer, but or Huff Duffer, but specifically like for for videos and, and where you can do the navigation on the site. And so it took me a while, um, but I finally got this working. And so I'm inter very interested in like implementing this in something like exact, sort of exactly like Huffer Duffer, where you're pulling in a bunch of different sources and getting and getting the ability to navigate around the site while still having a perfectly static HTML website. There's no React, there's no Shadow DOM. It's all working like SEO and stable and standard HTML. It's just once you start navigating it layers over, um, which is really sort of the, I think like the next level for things like this. So I don't have to go to, you know, uh, a podcast player or rely on them all, to your point, being in the right format where I can pull down an actual audio file. I don't know how to stop sharing. Uh, here we go. There. <laughs> uh, so that's like something I've been playing around with because the timeline site I have is very reliant on a elaborate JSON file. Um, that then gets reassembled by JavaScript into new HTML. But because this process, this HTMX um, script, which is very lightweight, is just doing HTML fragments and mutation, I can actually look at ways to just pull the whole HTML file from another static page, alter it slightly, and drop it in using a mutation process of my HTML. Um, and sort of save me on maintaining two parallel versions of an HTML element, one in JavaScript and one in, in that case, in Nunjax. Um, yeah. So I, that was just, it made me think of that. And I think like that's sort of a cool thing where we're thinking about storage um, and linking things, ways to like navigate through a collection of links and also play them in some way. Um, there's like a web ring version of HTMX, which does just embed other web pages into your web page, which is like the, the most extreme version. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I thought it'd be interesting to this group. It might be ideas people have from it or ideas people have about it that they could tell me if you, if you're thinking about something that you'd like to see there. Um, I know one of the core HTMX committers is how I came along it. It's a it's an open source project, small to medium size, but pretty lively. A good way to avoid React. I my first question is having watched you do that, if you wanted to point me at a particular page, is there an actual permalink URL you could give me to make yeah. me see the same thing you saw versus me having to, here's the URL, but then you've got to do X, Y, and Z to see the same thing nope. I'm seeing. It's all, it's all static HTML pages. All that is happening in the background is HTMX, instead of navigating you to the static HTML page, pulls the static HTML page in, finds the part of it that's changing, and mutates the HTML to change only that part. Um, so all the static, like once this is live, obviously the website's not in very good shape. It's just something I've put together to make sure that my hypothesis can be proven out as a working web page. Um, but now that I've done that, I can build it out. But yeah, once it's published, it's all just static HTML. Um, and in theory, like you could turn off JavaScript and everything would work perfectly fine as well. Of course, you wouldn't get a video player because that's all JavaScript to set up, but um, you could navigate around the site just fine. And that way, like if there are embeds that are in a particular format or in YouTube or whatever, and you can't get them anywhere else, you just pull them in. And the little player that I'm building, the idea is right now it's YouTube only, but the idea is theoretically, 
it's just HTML and an embed, be it an iframe or something else. Theoretically, I could integrate more than one type of embed in there. And then you can have playlists of embeds from different platforms and just have it work like a normal playlist where it advances to the next one and the next one and the next one, um, which is exciting to me because I like bringing in the original format where possible. Podcasts are intended to be downloaded. So something like Huff Duffer works for that in the way that it works, or at least like good podcasts are intended to be downloaded. Um, but for other formats, it's not so easy, especially when it comes to video. Um, and that's sort of the cool thing, right? Because everywhere there's a static page. So there's no extra work to like, like there's so much extra work in React or Next.js to make it so that it generates static pages that exist at URLs, right? Instead of you come to a URL and then some API has to be called and your router has to be set up, et cetera, et cetera. Here, the, it's just static pages in HTML. And I really like that conceptually as a model instead of React. And one of the interesting things about HTMX is uh, it, it wouldn't work for this particular implementation, but you can just layer it on to an existing page where it just takes your links and instead of them being hyperlinks that transition you to a new URL, they're HTMX requests that look for HTMX instructions. And by HTMX requests, I mean, it's just a, a get request that pulls an HTML page and then does something. Um, or it could pull an HTML fragment or a number of other things. Um, so like I'm interested in layering it onto like a podcasting website on WordPress um, that does, uh, that just like you take the WordPress theme and you isolate the right parts and you use HTMX in the right parts. And you don't have to change anything about how WordPress is serving the page or any of the existing pages. You're adding a, like 1.4 kilobytes of JavaScript and a bunch of HTML custom properties. And suddenly you have a podcast website where you can navigate around and have the podcast continue to play in the background, which is like, you'd think that this would be like a straightforward thing that everyone would implement, but people have, but, but I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it is difficult to do. It's not something that HTML is natively intended for. And even though like React theoretically is supposed to make this easy, like obviously it isn't because very few places actually do it. Like the only big site I can think of is like NPR, right? Other than that, I can't think of a player that persists through navigation on any of the major websites I go to. Um, and this provides like a potential way that it could be done really easily because most websites have pieces of the website that are isolated, pieces of the website that are an isolated, that change as you navigate. And you can control it by just layering the appropriate data properties on the HTML. I'm going to do a write-up once it's all working um, with more details. But like, I think it's really interesting in the idea that you could take your existing website that's generated by WordPress or static stuff or whatever and just have a new layer of interactivity that HTML normally is missing. Yeah. That is cool. I've got a question. Well, um, my brain's too full right now to, with this and other stuff, um, to, to ask the question or figure out the question. But I have the question. Um, how about a chat service that's using individual HTML files for the messages and then HTMX to assemble it? Yeah, awesome. that could work. I, I don't see a reason why I couldn't, right? Like in addition to using, in addition to just pulling an HTML page, finding the parts that mutate and then mutating them, it also is set up in such a way that you can just, like the the other way that a lot of people use it is they have APIs that just provide a, HTML fragments and then yeah. HTMX mutates them in in some way. Um, and the player like combines HTMX with, um, custom HTML elements and their capacity to react to on-page events, which HTMX provides, along with component mount, unmount, and other stuff like that. So you have a lot of automated interactivity. The video player 
pulling in and starting the YouTube player, that's all just when I load an HTMX fragment, there's an event that says, you know, page has mutated. And when that goes, I scan for an invisible span that has all the metadata about the video and pull it in um, using the custom HTML um, listeners. So like it's, you could do a whole bunch of things with this potentially, um, depending on what you want to do. Like like with everything, the question is whether this is the right tool for that particular job. It's just hard to tell without more detail. So another random idea is using markdown fragments instead of HTML fragments and have HTMX, you know, render them on the fly. Yeah, it isn't really meant to do that, though I guess it <laughs> theoretically could. I think like the intent from something like HTMX is you have endpoints that do the rendering of the markdown yeah, on enough. their side, and then you pull it in using HTMX. So, it's certainly theoretically possible though. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I get it. I get why you would do that. But now I also, I guess I want to junk up the one point whatever <laughs> K bytes of JavaScript. It'd be cool if there were HTMX plugins and a plugin would be a markdown renderer, for instance. There are, so HTMX does have a plugin structure, so it should be possible to build an <laughs> HTMX plugin. I really don't know. I haven't played around with any plugins other than like different DOM mutation methods. Um, they have like their native one and two other ones that are like optimized for different use cases. Um, so I don't know, maybe, yeah, I, it should be possible. I mean, in theory, like your browser reads a markdown file as a text, an HTML text fragment. So there is technically HTML there as far as the browser is concerned. <laughs> Well, in some of our spaces, and I always thought it was fairly clever, and it's, I think, all done in JavaScript for TiddlyWiki, but you can start at a card and click on something that pulls up another card below it and then keep adding cards. So, And then as you do, the URL changes and becomes immensely long. But you can then say, I've used all these different cards to create a story, and then here's the URL for that story. So it's a, essentially a built-in playlist of all the notes and pieces that you can then share and then somebody can see that version. But it would be interesting to be able to do that in kind of a note space to say, I, I've got 8 million pages on my website, or let's be more realistic. I think I have somewhere in the range of about 60,000 pages on my personal website. But it'd be cool if I wanted to have a version of a whole bunch of different card pieces of content strung together in a continuous story to say, here's a bunch of small pieces I've written and then turn it into a longer story playlist or an article or some other thing. And then say, here's the URL for that. And you can then read through it. Um, which has now Good got Lord. Jerry buzzing. How can you use this for neo books? Well, so you've just circled directly into neo books like territory, except we wouldn't make a long, confusing URL out of it. We would just say, here's the list of, of nuggets that you want to roll up into whatever it is you want to present, however you want to present it. Yeah, so very, very much the way we're thinking. Yeah, I'd imagine you could do that though. Like, it wouldn't generate. An H like you wouldn't have a static HTML page. That would no. be like a dynamically generated one. You'd be, I you'd, suppose you'd be in, traversing pages, or you would roll things up into a serial text to to pretend to be a book. Yeah, I but, suppose like in theory you could assemble them into a thing, and then like have a button that bakes the resulting HTML into static HTML in some way. What was the name of those That'd little ovens that you could fake like you were cooking the? <laughs> Yeah, easy bake. Oven. Easy, bake. easy bake. Thank you. Yeah. They weren't very good. Oh, no. no. Horrible. And they were super small, but, you know, in case you don't want to gig 